This week, on the record, a severe tragedy puts juvenile justice in the spotlight. Attorney General Andrew Bailey shines it on divisive racial politics. The president of the Missouri NAACP responds on the record. Why St. Louis Mayor Tashara Jones balked at this particular notion of hiring more police? Which candidates jumped into big races for high office in Missouri's primary? How much Illinois could spend on health care for undocumented migrants? Senate Republican Leader John Curran is on the record. And one surefire way politicians can etch their name in history. We check the record. It's all coming up right now. Welcome to The Record, and thank you for joining us. I'm Mark Maxwell. The careful delivery of justice might just be the most sacred, most precious, and valuable thing our government does. We entrust our courts with enormous responsibility, especially when minors are involved, and especially when they're caught up in violence. Let's lay out a quick timeline before we turn to our quick guest, our first guest here. March 7th, a uniformed guard breaks up a scrum in the halls of Hazelwood East High School. At least one teen girl is suspended. That same teen girl returns to an area not far from the high school, about a half a mile away after hours, and becomes involved in a second fight, this one more vicious. She suffers a severe injury and is hospitalized. Within days, video of her life-threatening injury spread rapidly online. Almost immediately, police investigate, refer charges to the juvenile courts, and her family clings to hope that she'll survive. March 11, Attorney General Andrew Bailey, whose office has nothing at all to do with the prosecution or investigation of the facts in this case, injects his opinion. He says the girl shown in the video slamming the victim's head into the pavement should be charged as an adult. Some international media even pick up the story and incorrectly assume maybe he's the prosecutor. He's not. It's a nifty way for a low-profile political appointee who's never won an election to boost his name recognition by hitching his wagon to this shocking tragedy. But his office had no information about anything other than the video itself. We don't have any um, um, authority or ability to get information on juvenile courts cases. They are sealed to protect the, the privacy of the juvenile courts unless they're certified and that decision is also made by the family court. That's the St. Louis County prosecutor. He would be next in line to take over this case if the juvenile court certifies the suspect to be tried as an adult. He even went to Hazelwood East, the same high school, and he said if he doesn't have inside info on the specifics of that criminal case, the attorney general most certainly doesn't. That would soon become very evident. March 13, Bailey trades the attention he uh, created into this appearance on Fox News. He tells a cable news host that students at Hazelwood, quote, attend a school that has a history of promoting DEI programs that promote racial divisiveness at the expense of having uniformed police in their schools. That's not true. He also blamed the school for, quote, promoting this culture of violence. March 22nd, doctors move her out of intensive care. Her mom says she's breathing on her own in stable condition. Same day, Bailey launches a so-called investigation looking for ways to try and prove the theory he had already floated on Fox News that maybe diversity programs had something to do with the violent attack. March 25th, the next day, police said no, it didn't. We reported a number of glaring errors in Bailey's letter to the district. March 26th, the school district comes out and confirms our reporting, saying the school resource officers Bailey assumed were maybe forced off the job years ago were actually back and in schools that did not have any sworn police, the district had hired extra security guards to patrol those halls. Bailey's entire premise was crumbling. He confessed to lifting his facts or his errors from other media, not from original sources, not like a real investigation. The NAACP certainly took note that while a victim was still sitting in a hospital with severe fractures in her skull, the attorney general was turning that terrible tragedy into a political attack against diversity standards in school. It's just the worst segue into political nonsense that, uh, that he could have come up with. In his case, he think he's talking to an extremist group of people who uh, accept that type of division. So the AG should stop politicizing the office of the people, the office that represents all the people of Missouri. Stop using it for political points. It's very dangerous, especially when you think we're gonna sit idly and watch you throw away children unnecessarily. It would be helpful if he would reach out to organizations like ours who work in this space daily. And we have many other cases that we would like for the AG to examine. And we turn now to the president of Missouri's NAACP chapter, Nimrod Chapel, joining us from Jefferson City. Great to have you with us. I, I wanna ask you what can and what should 
and attorney general do to fight discrimination? Well, so I think that first he's got to get a good ascertainment of the facts, understand what's happening. He can look in any corner of Missouri and understand that discrimination is still present within our state. The NAACP gave the Missouri Travel Advisory, the first one entered by the organization in the entire country. He could look at those issues and just engage in dialogue about some meaningful resolution of the issues that he's actually in control of. The vehicle stops report comes out every June and the numbers just go up. Yet we've never heard from the attorney general. And that's Families that and organizations like the NAACP have asked the office to engage in efforts to promote justice, to promote equality, just treating people the same under the law. And they get a deaf ear. That's a report that actually is published by his office, no less. I, I want to ask you, though, a, a lawyer for the school district uh, asked Attorney General Bailey, quote, do you represent all citizens of Missouri or only the white citizen? From your view, what is your answer to that question? Well, and, and it's so telling that he is only picking up the issues that he wants to, and those happen to, for example, in this case, to be for people who are Caucasian, the white people. But there are lots of examples, such as the folks in Republic, Missouri, where they were using the N-word like a morning greeting, making monkey calls to a little black girl getting on the bus, and the school district does nothing. Representative uh, Black from that area has even introduced legislation that's made it through committee to equate discriminatory treatment of minorities to bullying and enforcing those standards so the school districts engage in the active zero tolerance policy that they should. I would point he out, support uh, I, we have this Zoom call, I don't mean to cut you off. I would point out that the Attorney General has put out press releases warning or threatening he might bring a human rights violation uh, or some sort of investigation, but he hasn't actually done that. He, actually, he, he, he later backed off and said he would do that, quote, uh, if that's what the results of the investigation necessitate. He also said this in that statement to us. He's not backing down, he's not apologizing, but he says, quote, DEI programs that advance certain races over others are illegal and unconstitutional, and he'll use the full authority of that office to put an end to it. Is that your understanding of diversity, equity, and inclusion, that it's somehow reverse racism against white people? Not at all. It's for fair treatment of everyone. If we spent more time engaging in work and DEI work to engage, make sure that people are treated fairly, everyone would be better off. It might have averted this issue. And that's what's so ironic, that he would use the power of his office that could call for equality and justice for every Missouri citizen, regardless of how God created us. But instead, he creates a divisive point that he hopes to engage uh, more of the public in. Just divisiveness. It's unnecessary and inappropriate. And the last point I would make is those, those two police departments that did pull out a while back, they did so saying that they, they didn't want to go through an extra DEI training because they already had their own. Of course, the attorney general hasn't sued them for their practice of DEI. But Nimrod Chapel, we're running low on time. I, I really appreciate you joining us. Thanks for logging on. Thank you. Thank you very much. We'll be back with more political news just after the break. Decision 2024 is underway. The Missouri primary is set. The field, we know what it is. There are a lot of big races to watch for. In the race for Secretary of State, at least four Republican candidates have filed, including State Senator Mary Elizabeth Coleman. We thought she was going to run for Congress. She switched her plans. The governor's race is also competitive in both parties. Secretary of State Jay Ashcroft, Lieutenant Governor Mike Kehoe, and State Senator Bill Igel at the top of the pack there are vying to be the Republicans on the ballot come November. And House Minority Leader Crystal Quaid, she's going to face off against businessman Mike Hamra. Some seats in Congress also have an interesting election battle. Corey Bush will face a primary challenge from St. Louis County Prosecutor Wesley Bell and former State Representative Maria Chappelle Nadal running there too. The Missouri primary set for August 6. This week, the U.S. Supreme Court appeared skeptical on restricting nationwide access to a popular abortion pill. The court heard arguments in a case involving mifepristone, the most commonly used method for abortion in the country. The senior counsel arguing that case is Erin Hawley, wife to Missouri Senator Josh Hawley. She argued religious doctors should not have to violate their conscience and treat women who are experiencing heavy bleeding after taking the abortion pill. Millions of Americans have used mifepristone to safely end their pregnancies. Without question, the FDA's actions have made taking chemical abortion drugs less safe. Rolling back FDA's changes would unnecessarily restrict access to mifepristone with no safety justification. You can no longer, no more mandate what we do in the city of St. Louis's police department, no more than I can no. mandate what you do in St. Charles. This mandates a group on No. Hiring. So are you going to mandate that Clayton hires 10 more officers? We're not. But you're We're not, and saying. you're not going to mandate that We're St. Louis city does either.
Those tense moments, the exchange breaking out at the East West Gateway Council meeting, supposed to be a boring meeting, anything but. The council wants to create a new advisory board in St. Charles County Executive Steve Elman. He butted in. He said St. Louis needs to hire at least 10 police officers for every new social worker it hires before that formation can happen. If, if, if it helps to have social workers, I'm all for it. But you can't do it when you're 300 people short on your police department. Elman's motion failed procedurally, but politically, he baited the mayor into saying on the record that she shouldn't have to hire as many police as he wants them to, not that quickly. Something we might hear again when she's running for re-election next year. We talked to Illinois Senator John Curran, the Republican minority leader, after this. Welcome back. Joining us now on the record is Illinois Senate Minority Leader, Republican John Curran. It's good to have you with us all the way from the Chicago suburbs, perhaps our longest traveling guest to be on this program so far. So glad to have you with us. Mark, very nice to be with you. We covered Governor J.B. Pritzker's State of the State address, and he talked about a budget crunch uh, in that address. His budget proposal included a bunch of spending on this migrant issue. Would it be helpful to the Illinois state budget if governors like uh, the governor in Texas would, would stem the tide of all these migrants that they're sending to Illinois? Stemming the tide would be helpful to Illinois. Um, I, would, I would tell you it's red states and blue states alike. It's not just Texas. They're coming to Illinois because Governor Prisker has created over six years a non-citizen welfare state. And those programs are attractive to anyone coming to this state, and it's a burden on the taxpayers of Illinois. Programs like? Uh, Health care for undocumented or illegal uh, uh, residents of the state. Um, it is a robust health care program, better than anything you or I would enjoy. Uh, in our private plans, and that is something that is I wouldn't qualify. funded to a billion a yeah. year. Uh, I think it's only for certain age groups. You no, know, it's people that are older, 40, or children. 42 and above. And, and we're not talking about all kids, mm -hmm. um, so everyone, uh, it doesn't matter citizen status, uh, you don't want to see qualifies that for all kids. We're not talking about all kids. We're talking about that 42 working age population. Mm -hmm. um, if you happen to be a legal immigrant to this uh, to the state of Illinois, you, you don't even qualify. You have to be in an illegal status. Now, I asked Governor Pritzker uh, when we had him on this program several weeks ago, did you, do you see that as an incentive for someone who comes from maybe a lesser country to, to come here? And, and he said, no, this is a cost-saving measure because if these people walk into some clinic without insurance, they're uninsured, the burden there, he said, this is just a math problem, right? He said, this, uh, providing this insurance helps to keep our costs low. Mark, not true. And if, if that was truly, um, if that was something we would see states emulating what Illinois is doing, we are not. We are a true outlier in the Midwest on this, as well as many of the other spending programs we have for uh, undocumented uh, residents of the state. And that is what makes Illinois attractive, and that drives the flow. I, I want to try to tie this into how it affects voter, uh, viewers in our area, because most of the migrants are populated in and around the Chicago area. But the state budget is, is having this ripple effect. Senator Dick Durbin expressed that from the floor of the U.S. Senate and on this program as well. He said that uh, a lot of these arrivals are putting, he said they're going to bankrupt uh, our, our states, our systems. That's the word he used. So it's not just a conservative talking point. At this point, it's, it's a mathematical reality at some point. How can Senate Republicans uh, get at the issue? What, what, what is the fix? Well, the fix here first is a full, transparent accounting of what we are spending. The governor's only telling us some of what's being spent. We're not going program by program within the programs what's being spent on this population. We've asked for that. The governor has continued to evade those requests. We need a transparent accounting. That's step one. Isn't that the comptroller's job? The comptroller uh, has taken a cursory step, but when you're actually on her website, it doesn't tell you what it's being spent on, who's receiving the funds, so it, it is in no way a transparent accounting. The Comptroller's Office has said, we're showing you every dollar that's being spent. We're showing you where it's going. And you think that there's money that's being, what, hidden? What, what is that? Absolutely. Look at the disclaimer on the Comptroller's own website. That disclaimer, when you first go on, it says, this is not everything. So if they're telling you that, explain that disclaimer to me and go ahead and take a look at what uh, any of those uh, line items, there's no information for the, for, for the public to actually discern what's being, what it's being spent on and who. So do you want to see that program ended or reformed? In the end, what do you want to see that, if we're just talking about the health care, there are other expenses like popping up shelters and helping people Welcoming get jobs. Welcoming centers and yes, there, there is all, to the tune of over a billion dollars. What we are talking about is this is an unfair burden being forced on Illinois taxpayers. So as much as the federal government is going to pick up the tab, fine. But beyond that, Illinois taxpayers are being un unfairly burdened with this cost. When you, look at, when you look at the state of Missouri, Missouri 
requires verification on legal either citizenship, residency, you're, that you're here lawfully to receive public benefits. In Illinois, it's the opposite. You have to be in an illegal status to receive those public benefits in, in Illinois. We, we, it's backwards. I'll just point out, uh, you, you cannot qualify for the Affordable Care Act health insurance under Obamacare if you're an undocumented migrant. Right. That, that, so that's not even just a Missouri thing, a red state thing. It's also something that President Obama signed into law. Uh, so for some of our viewers who may not be as familiar with you, given that you're from the Chicago suburbs and in the Chicago area, uh, you spent a lot of time working in the prosecutor's office there. That's your background, a criminal mm -hmm. prosecutor. Yes. Uh, people that are very close to politics may know that Chicago, a massive democratic city in, in America, of course, it has a big ongoing count of the ballots there. Uh, in Chicago, and it's very close. There was a progressive prosecutor, sort of the, an, an underling to Kim Fox, the predecessor there, and then more of a moderate judge who talked a little bit more about law and order there. How do you define or analyze that race? It's come so close. What does it mean for the future of democratic politics and prosecuting in big cities that a race like that would come down to the wire? I think you see areas in the suburbs and throughout the city that, that realize they're on the wrong uh, path and they're taking on the established Cook County Democratic machine in that race. It is very close. Um, we, but I will tell you, we're not going to cede any ground or territory there. We have a Republican candidate for the general election. In the city of Chicago? In, the, in Cook County, yes, um, which in encompasses County. the city of Chicago. Um, so, you know, that's not done. But that race right now is coming down to the wire to see who the Democratic uh, nominee is. I think you've stumped me because I, I tried for a minute to think of the last time a sitting member of the Illinois legislature resided in the city limits of Chicago. There's been some just close to it, but I don't know. The la I'm not trying to ask you that question. Well, I, I would tell you the last Republican to hold office in Cook County is Jack O'Malley, who was a, a process, was the state's attorney. Uh, the, the, I think the next office Republicans hold in Cook County, countywide, is going to be that state's attorney's office as well because of our policies when it comes to public safety. Public safety has been jeopardized in Cook County, uh, City of Chicago, and throughout the Collar Counties because of the policies of Governor J.B. Pritzker and his mm -hmm. allies. Last fall, we saw the most sweeping implementation of the big safety act, but that being the end of cash bail. And we saw jails start to reform that. They had the 90 days to get everybody who was in there out or adjudicated uh, to have their hearing to, be, to, to stay behind bars. Have you seen enough yet to know whether or not all of those warnings that Republicans issued ahead of time were, were, were true or were they overheated? The warnings on it not being expansive enough in terms of a detention net are absolutely true. And all throughout uh, Cook County and the Collar Counties, talking to state's attorneys, they have uh, example after example of uh, offenders charged um, what they believe to be a serious crime that the judge cannot even consider to uh, detaining that individual. Beyond that, in terms of what you mentioned, uh, in terms of uh, the speedy right to a speedy trial, there has been no, uh, any warnings on that have not really played out in, in fairness. I think prosecutors have stepped up and have adjusted uh, their schedules in terms of bringing cases to trial in an expeditious manner. It's great to have you with us. I wish we had more time. Until next time, thanks for joining us. Mark, nice to meet you. We're back in a moment. Imagine a world in which Donald Trump named Kamala Harris his vice president, or Mike Pence picking Bernie Sanders as his, or even if we turn the, back, uh, the clock a bit more, Barack Obama picking Mitt Romney to run with him. Look, none of these comparisons are perfect, but they're actually not terribly far off from what we almost saw just four presidential races ago when Senator John McCain, a Southwest Republican, came oh so close to picking New England liberal Joe Lieberman as his running mate. Lieberman had run for president himself in 2004 and lost, but he did something else that really stood out to McCain and the country. He showed courage, courage enough to buck his own party. It is hard to ignore the impact of the misconduct the president has admitted to. Or how about this? Imagine running for vice president in a race much closer than the one we saw in 2020, coming within 600 votes of winning the clinching key state that would have delivered the Electoral College, losing that state in a bitterly contested recount, and then standing on the floor of the Senate and accepting the results. This election is over. Who would do such a thing? Someone who believes this. I'm loyal to my party, but I have higher loyalty. Senator Joe Lieberman died Wednesday at 82. History will remember him as a statesman who dared to reach across the aisle. A Connecticut firefighter and union leader remembered Lieberman as a public servant, the kind John F. Kennedy might have dubbed as a profile in courage. He wrote this in his hometown paper, The Hartford Current. Lieberman exemplifies what Americans demanded in the leadership of this country, the ability to compromise, to reach across the political aisle, and bring about proven results and unity. 
There we go. Uh, anyway, we're going to uh, let you go at this time. Thanks for joining us. Until next week, we're off the record.